This is an exciting day <laughs> at the Mount Sinai Beth Israel Brooklyn Hospital. And uh, we're delighted uh, to have Dr. Davis, the Chief Executive Officer of the Mount Sinai Health System with us. <laughs> Dr. Charney, the Dean of the Mount Sinai Icon School of Medicine. <laughs> we're really honored to have the two of you joining us today. Uh, the way we're going to run the town meeting today, because it is Brooklyn, so it's, it's going to be done the Brooklyn way, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to speak for about 25, 30, for 30 minutes to define how we arrive at the Mount Sinai Beth Israel Brooklyn mission. And for the second half, we'll turn over for questions and answers, and depending on the nature of questions, may be answered by me, Dr. Davis, or Dr. Charney. <laughs> now, one of, the, one of the most fascinating things about healthcare is that it continues to evolve. And today, when we're looking at the healthcare system, uh, we have to recognize that the one that we are accustomed to evolved in 1965, when Title 18, the Medicare program was created, and Title 19, the Medicaid program was created. Those two programs from 1965 on created a healthcare system that was considered to be unsustainable. And so if you look at healthcare, uh, when those two amendments were made to the 1935 Social Security Act, it will forever change healthcare. Now, today, when you're looking at the total national uh, gross domestic product, or GDP, as the, as the economist would like to refer to, you have $6,300 billion in the United States GDP. Healthcare is 20% of that national GDP, which is approximately $1,271 billion. Now, to give you an idea in terms of dollars, so for every productive dollars in the United States, 20 cents are currently spent on health care. And as a result, for some years now, going back to the 80s, the executive branch and the two legislative branches were fighting over and stopping the tremendous escalation of health care costs. And obviously, if you look back prior to September 2010, you realize that health care cannot continue at that pace. And so when you look at it carefully, and then you look a little further down, and the next greatest expenditure, 19% of the GDP, is the United States Federal Workers' Pension. 16% is education. And 13% is defense. 8% is welfare. So when you look at the United States budget, there's been consistent concern for health care expenditures. But the 1965 two amendments created a system that was highly fee-for-service, volume-driven, and service-on-demand. So the contention has been through the 80s and the 90s, and I personally lived through them, and the year 2000 came, and the contention was there had to be a system put in place to stop the escalation of health care expenditure. That resulted when the president controlled both houses with the passage of the September 2010 Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And I think that unbeknown to many Americans that healthcare expenditure being so high that that act, for those who for understood the spirit of the act, was to stop the way the healthcare expenditure was being spent. So you have to look at every single one of the concepts, the ideas, innovations from the 80s and the 90s and the year 2000 were folded into that massive 4,000 pages. So you look at some of these elements, and, I'm, and we're living through it. That legislation is unique in the following way. It's implemented from September 2010 and will end September 30th, 2016. So because it is implemented over time, a lot of folks don't recognize the impact of that legislation. But we in the hospital, we feel it. So just give you an example. In 2013, October 1st, the disproportionate share payments of the Medicare payment was severely cut. And the impact on health care has been unbelievable. 
for the little hospital up the block, when I put together the 2014 budget, I had to close a gap of $9 million out of an $80 million budget. And I did it. But the point is, every single hospital must deal with these changes. And we're talking about the two midnight rule and the impact on Mount Sinai is $42 million. We're talking about 30-day readmissions and the impact on Mount Sinai. And you're looking at hundreds of millions of dollars of revenues that will be reduced and cut as a result of the escalation of the, of the federal spending, federal, state, and local spending on health care. So, so you look at what's happening. Now, this is a community hospital. We're very, very fortunate that we're still standing because the very special Beth Israel brand that emerged from the Lower East Side in the 1890s, founded by the peddlers of the Lower East Side. And that brand is preserved because it's today flying under the very iconic Mount Sinai brand, founded in 1852 on East 39th Street. And so we are indeed fortunate that we're standing today. Now, more importantly, we're in Brooklyn. So you look at Brooklyn, there's 16 hospitals. 13 of the 16 on the brink of bankruptcy. And so you have to think about it. And two weeks ago, the New York State Department of Health, with the total support of the governor, indicated clearly that out of the 203 New York State hospitals, 50% of those will be merged or absorbed by the end of, by, by the, end of the three years and will result in reducing the 203 to 100 hospitals in New York State. So mergers and acquisitions are moving rapidly. And if you are following the stories, Long Island College Hospital will be folding officially. And it's been, you know, we've been hearing that, you know, probably 25, 30 times. But I think this time they're finished. Why? The economics of healthcare. The new model uh, that will be created one day will not allow fee-for-service volume-driven, and service on demand. The new model may or may not be the accountable care organization. It will be something similar. Requires that healthcare institutions and systems manage the population's health and assume full risk. And in fact, Mount Sinai started that, ACO, and if you were following the Wall Street Journal last summer, there was a remarkable article detailing the impact when you manage healthcare population. One chronically ill, one chronically ill patient prior to joining Mount Sinai had consumed 144,500 to the Medicare program. Under the Mount Sinai program, her cost was brought down to 37,500. But Mount Sinai only got paid 17,500 under the, under the capitated payment which is the future, incidentally, per member, per month, per year. I learned about this concept of capitated payment when I was in the insurance business for two and a half years prior to turning to the hospital business. And I want to tell you, it is unbelievable. You can't not contain medical cost. Now, because we're part of Mount Sinai, we're going to be exposed to and made available to us the innovations, the changes, the cutting edge tools to make it work. And this morning, Dr. Jeff Farber was here and made an, an eloquent and very informative presentation to our doctors. And it was exactly to show that in the future, you have to document in a certain way, and it's captured by the electronic health record. You can't go back to a paper record and claim you did something. And if it's not in the electronic health record, not only you don't get the credit for the care you provided, but you, you won't get paid for. So we're changing the way we deliver health care, but because we are part of Mount Sinai as a community hospital, remember the hallmark of a community hospital is how we, in partnership with our voluntary doctors, every doctor in the business world is referred to as a strategic business unit. So if we were to refer it that way, we would have 350 SBUs, and every SBU is unique. Every doctor is unique. But these doctors are fortunate to be with us. They're going to learn the ways to document, to justify their care, and to justify when we bill. So this is going to change healthcare. Now, what is the mission 
for a hospital in Brooklyn. The hospital in Brooklyn that wants to be number one. And we're fortunate that we are the flagship of the Mount Sinai Health System, system in Brooklyn. It's going to require doing, a ri doing it right and doing it well. And first and foremost, the patient experience of care. It started back in 2003. Experimentally, it started in the year 2000 at about 350 hospitals across the country. In 2003, it was mandated. It was referred to as the Hospital Consumer Assessment of Health Providers and Systems, or HCAP. But the report card that we get as a hospital says is the patient experience of care. They mean the same thing. In order to compete successfully, every single hospital to survive must score ex very, very high on the HCAP score and translate to a patient experience of care report card. Now, I want to mention report card. Everything we do today is captured in the form of a report card. It was never like that. I grew up in a system in the 70s, 80s, and the 90s where we as hospital people didn't get a grade. I transformed myself in the way Darwin wanted me to, right? When my neck was short and the leaves kept on growing, I stretched my neck. I kept on growing my neck till I could reach the leaves at the top. So that's what we're required to do today, to survive as Darwin indicated that's how evolution works. And healthcare is going through that major evolution. Now here's the important thing. Where are we currently? We're at the juncture between the past and the future. And that makes it very, very hard. Because some of the things we're doing is a carryover from the past, i.e. the acute care that we're doing. It's from the past. There's going to be less and less acute care the way we're delivering it today. Future is going to be emphasis. When you manage the health of the population, you don't want them to be in the hospital. For that matter, you don't want them to see a doctor. So it's a different thing. So the future is very different from the past, and yet we're in the middle. And in essence, I'm telling my folks, we have it till September 30th, 2016. Because on October 1st, 2016, all of the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act sections would have been implemented. So our emphasis is on every single report card items. I tracked it. Monsignor is currently tracking about 70 of those metrics for quality and safety. The total universe is 126. Every year on the Jeremy Bowles leadership, you're going to see that these metrics has, would have to increase. Because by 2016, all of them will be put in place. I had a chart in my last place, and we stare at these 126 metrics every day. But that's just quality and safety metrics. Financial performance is on a set of metrics. Everything we do translates to a report card. Individual doctors standing here, we all have your report card. I intend to work for a few years. That's why I have to reach my neck up, you see. Uh, and those of you who want to stay, you have to do the same thing. It's, a, it's just the nature of our job. Now, looking at that so, that, so that's one patient experience of care. Number one goal for our, for our hospital. And every single staff is required to do that. Every single staff. With a lot of the emphasis in nursing, you know, to improve patient experience of care. When you look at health care in general, it is about providing efficiencies and create effectiveness. These are all the things we have to focus on. And, 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 and if we don't focus on them, before you know it, you have a, you have a, we already have a deficit. I mean, you certainly don't want to grow them uh, uh, far and beyond. And the other thing that's fascinating to me is that Medicare going forward, using the uh, pay for performance, the value-based purchasing program, specifically the pay for performance elements, the Medicare revenue that we normally get would be withheld. So when they say penalty, when Medicare talks about penalty, they're not saying we're going to pay them. They're saying your normal check, parts of it would be withheld. That's revenue that's normally built into the budget would be withheld. And there's a rapid, rapid increase of denial of payments. 
So that's why it was so important that the doctors are documenting appropriately, accurately, for the care that they provide. Historically, I know, I know this for a fact in Brooklyn, we deliver a range of care as far as my arms can reach, but the documentation is very scant. Going forward, that cannot be. The idea from the doctor's point of view was, I've done all the job on behalf of the patient. And they captured just a few words. Today, that bill, when it's sent out, it, it will be denied. And that's the reason why there's so much focus on making sure that the doctors are really learn, and, uh, and as Dr. Hammer agreed this morning, our pulmonologist, that it's a new language. It's a new set of learning. And, uh, and every doctor, in essence, has to go back to school here with, with the help of Dr. Faber and others from Mount Sinai. And the other thing I, I, I want to mention, because I see folks uh, in, in, in the room, uh, we're also fortunate because even though we're one small hospital, we're one small hospital and one big hospital. It is one. So when you see folks carrying different titles, uh, whether they refer to as coming from corporate or not, it is all one hospital. That's where the future is. And, but, but we're indeed fortunate to, a, to be able to focus on exactly what we have to do. So our mission, in conclusion, is to work with our voluntary medical staff, community partners, whether it's nursing homes or other care providers, community organizations, whether it's Hatzola Flatbush, Council of Jewish Organizations, to strengthen the services we can provide to the community. And for that, they'll vote with their feet, and they'll come here. And you know, when you look across all the problems in the other hospitals, there unfortunately, there's gonna be a shrinkage of the system. And that's not the making of Mount Sinai. That's the making of the federal budget, the state budget, and local budgets for healthcare. And that's why, be mindful that if we have 203 hospitals today, it will get down to 100 in a matter of one or two, if not three years. And you will see that. Uh, now, uh, I, uh, we, we still have time, but I think that the spirit of the, the, spirit of the staff uh, that I found here, uh, from doctors to housekeepers to nurses, uh, we have an extraordinary group of people. Uh, and uh, because we have so many good people, we are gonna be number one in Brooklyn. And uh, for those who have followed my career, uh, you know I'm gonna pull the exact same series of steps running BI Brooklyn in the same way. And those are summed up in five key elements that have always driven me. They create a level of fairness, respect, caring, being nice, and compassionate. Those five elements have solidified my entire 45 years in this business. And uh, you know, those of you who worked with me before, because some of you have double jobs, so you have worked at the other place and here, so I'm indeed fortunate to have you on this side too, uh, so you can spread the exact true stories from the other campus. And I think that I'm excited. Uh, we're very fortunate have to have Dr. Davis here and Dr. Charney here. Uh, and one of the things, when you look at the hospital today, it is inpatient-based. It will not be inpatient-based. So as I'm speaking, there is a, a master plan, the process of being developed, to look at expanding the future of outpatient services, urgent care, urgent care, because that is going to be the future, because the government is not going to continue to pay inpatient care. And inpatient compa capacity will continue to reduce. So those of you who follow the press, you may remember uh, two years ago, three years ago, uh, when the Medicaid uh, uh, redesign team, the MRT, formed a hospital group for Brooklyn. And even back then, it was calling for merging interfaith back then, Wyckoff and Brooklyn to one hospital. When, when they merge three into one, you know what that means? That means taking the total bed capacity and reduce by two-thirds. 
a year ago there was a story in the paper talking about the state is thinking of building a new hospital in Brooklyn to replace Brookdale, Kingsbrook, and Downstate. Same idea, to consolidate the three and bring one hospital together for a training site for SUNY Downstate Medical School. So the future, be mindful of that, is shrinking. And those of us with a healthcare job consider ourselves fortunate. These are real, upfront realities, and we have to face them. And that's why I said the only advantage we do have is uh, we have a unique situation. We're, we're the only one of the five major systems in the area where the chief executive officer of the system is sitting next to the dean on a regular basis. We're the only one with a truly integrated healthcare system and the medical school. And that gives us a tremendous, tremendous ability to do a lot of things that they're not able to do. So I think from, for those of you who come to work, uh, you're gonna hear me talk about this. Uh, we need to com continue to work with our staff on every single level with the five elements that I not only preach, I truly walk the talk. We have to do that. And when we engage our staff on the front line, in turn, they'll transfer the goodwill to the patient and their families. There's no other way to do it. Every single successful organization in the world have done it with one simple formula. You must connect with the workers. So those who are management here, uh, uh, you heard it from me. And the workers who are here, you heard it from me. That's a fundamental requirement. At this juncture, I want to I wanna turn to a couple of the questions. Uh, anyone else wants to ask a question, and I'll decide which uh, one of us will answer the question. So, um, actually, my first question is, you know, I, I want to find out certain things to see what I have to do <laughs> going back. Right. How many of you are getting our emails when we, when we do global, you know, notifications. global notification? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I want to make sure, that, you know, that's happening. Uh, um, and if it isn't, you should, you know, work through Lynn right. and he can communicate to right. us on, on how to fix that. So, for example, uh, related to graduate medical education, just announced yesterday that um, Michael Lightman is becoming the head of graduate medical education for the system. Uh, Michael has been the head of the you know, program at BI, and now he's going to continue with that, but I've elevated him for the entire system. And we have 2,000 house staff associated now with the school at, each of, uh, at all the hospitals. So we're now the largest GME program in the country. I've asked Michael, along with other members of the team, to start uh, developing a strategic plan on uh, looking at how our graduate programs are organized in relation to the missions of each of the hospitals. So I can't give you an exact answer right now, but I can tell you we're starting a, a process mm -hmm. of looking at the mission of each hospital, looking at the, the, gra the graduate training programs, looking at the size of each one, the quality of each one, and ultimately are going to come up with a strategic plan that makes sure that the mission and the training are matched and that um, our programs are designed to recruit the best house staff. So I'll get back to you on that, but we have started that process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Charney. Anyone else has a question? Yes, very, very good question. As far as age caps is concerned, one of the most fundamental uh, approach to improving age cap scores, first, sharing the data. So we have started that. So we've done an extensive sharing of the data, not just management, that every single worker should look exactly where our current scores are. And you first have to understand where you are, so that's sharing the score. Secondly, is make every single person aware that the patient experience of care is, cap is captured by a very small percentage of patients and their families. So, th so you can't cheat on that, meaning you have to be good and make patients and family feel good all the time, since only a very small group constitute or make up your scores. The other element that we have to tell the workers is that when you look at the choices, in order to get a point, the individual filling out that form must check always. If it says sometimes you don't get a score. Uh, 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 
and 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 that's and and that's one of the major problems. The way it's designed, you can't cheat. The person completing the form must say always. Yes, Dr. Charney. So patient satisfaction is is going to be critical critical to the success of our health system. And you might think, well, you know, that might relate dramatically to uh, how the hospital looks, the infrastructure. You know, a beautiful hospital, you get the best scores. That turns out not to be true. So we track, as Lynn mentioned, uh, literally uh, on a real-time basis, patient satisfaction scores at each of our hospitals. The hospital that's doing the best lately is Mount Sinai, Queens. Mm -hmm. The security guards being friendly. In fact, at Mount Sinai Hospital, the security guards are ranked higher than our faculty <laughs> by the students. <laughs> right? Because they're very friendly. You walk right. in, they say, how can I help you? Right. You know, and they treat our students great, too. So it's just, you know, yes, I, to emphasize what Lynn is saying, I'm sure Ken uh, feels exactly the same way. It's all about you as people caring about the patient at every level that will make this a destination for the patients in Brooklyn. Yeah, I want to add a few things. Um, we know that hourly rounding with meaning by nurses really changes the patient satisfaction scores. And part of that is sitting down at the bedside, not looking people from above, sitting down, talking to them about all the usual things, pain, position, and bathrooms, but also sharing something about yourself, you know, yes. talking to them as a person. You know, how are your kids? Oh, those are like my kids. Just make them understand that you're real. Second point that I want to make is something that Susan Somerville said at Beth Israel. She was talking about how that hospital will never be the best facility in Manhattan. Um, there are too many buildings that are all interconnected and too many rabbit warren corridors. <clears throat> but it can be the most compassionate hospital, she said. And she gave this example. How many of you have been in surgery? Hands up. Yes. Well, I can tell you my experience, which is something that she said. You remember the 10 seconds before you are anesthetized and you go out almost like it was yesterday. Your attention is so focused, you'll never forget it. And what she said is, imagine if every time someone goes into surgery, a doctor or a nurse puts a hand on you and says, you're in good hands, it's going to be great. You'll never forget it. That's right. You'll never forget it. But that's the little extra things that make people think this is a special place. And that's what we've got to remember. It's all about people. It's all about compassion. It's treating every patient as if they're special. Right. I, I want to give one other yeah. vignette. So we had graduation <coughs> last, uh, hmm. last week. And in, in, in my graduation uh, speech, I gave an example of compassion. And it relates to our medical students. So 26 of our medical students decided to have a little project where they went to the bedside of our patients at Mount Sinai Hospital and sat down with the patients and asked them a series of questions. Like, who was your best friend? Uh, what were some of the most meaningful experiences in your life? In other words, to get to know the patient. And they, the experience of the students was amazing because they realized how important that was to the patients. And one student wrote down and said, after I got to know the patient, the patient told me that she was going to put the student on her list of people that she prays for every day <laughs> and that she's going to pray for the student every day for the rest of her life. <laughs> Unbelievable. That's great. Uh, Ms. Reiser? Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to know, I know that HCAPS is very important, right. and a lot of it, it's, like we said, it's all about the people who are working here to improve it. How do we motivate the employees to get this done so we can be excellent well, always. Well, yeah, and, and I think that's the question that I uh, you know, uh, deal with it by saying that the only way that the ordinary worker will transfer uh, the fairness, the respect, the caring, and being nice and compassion to, in my view, to a uh, patient and family is if they feel they're treated that way uh, by the organization that they work for. So fundamental to our goal, and I mentioned that as my number one goal, is make this uh, place a good place to work. And once you accomplish making the place a good place to work, and you, and you truly practice those five elements uh, to each other at the workplace, 
they get transferred uh, to patients, to families, uh, without, without any thought. Because we're, we're all humans, and people like to be treated uh, in the way uh, that it's fair, respectful, caring, nice, and compassion. And, uh, and, and it doesn't matter which organization it is, if you truly live up to those uh, attributes, you will be very surprised. Uh, and, 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 and incidentally, that's how it's done by successful organizations, and it is done that way in the military, and which uh, uh, is the origin of what management is all about, is founded in the military. So let me add yeah. a few things. Um, a lot of it has to do with management, with putting the right person as the president, who sets a standard, who's here and makes this an important value and talks to you about it all the time. Um, and that has to translate to the managers, who have to tell the people under them that patients come first all the time. So it's a core value of the organization that starts with the president. Um, we should understand something else that was part of what Lynn said. Only two hospitals in Brooklyn have a positive bottom line. Um, we have seen the St. Vincent's bankruptcy, the Cabrini bankruptcy. We can go on and on and on with all the hospitals that have been bankrupt. There are, what, two plus million people who live in this borough, and yet most of the hospitals are nearing bankruptcy. That's both an opportunity and a message. The opportunity is peop keep people in Brooklyn. This is Mount Sinai now. They should get the same care here. And if it's more complex, they get transferred to Mount Sinai. But the consequence of not recognizing where the industry is going is not recognizing that the imperative for you to put patients first is your livelihoods. It's about you, too. We'd like to be great for our patients, but this place won't exist in 15 years if we aren't the leaders and we don't differentiate ourselves because, as Lynn said, half those hospitals are projected to go in New York State. We're already overbedded in this borough, even though they may scream at Litch that we need more beds. <clears throat> the reality is that if you look at the distribution of beds across the United States and what's needed for a community of this size, we're still overbedded. Mm -hmm. And as that, as healthcare changes, as Lynn outlined, it's going to be even more overbedded. So to be great, to be compassionate, sure, it's great for your patients. It's also imperative for you. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. <coughs> Hi, how are you? Um, before I ask my question, I'd like to give a little history. Um, 3,000 years ago, there was a revelation on the old Mount Sinai. At the uh, 3,000 years ago, there was a revelation at the old Mount Sinai, let's call it. Today, there's a new Mount Sinai. My question is, can you reveal or disclose to us any plans in the making about a physical expansion of the place? We talk of Brooklyn. We talk about patient care, which is very important. But the workplace and where the patients are, where the staff are, is also important. Yesterday, um, I happened to be at the medical ethics meeting in, uh, on Fifth Avenue on Mount Sinai, and I was quite impressed with the physical structures there. Uh, would you make Brooklyn also a Fifth Avenue? <laughs> Let's, <laughs> um, there are a lot of things to say to answer that question. The first is to remember that when you walk through some of the nicest places in Mount Sinai, you saw the names of people like Hess and Tish, and those are there because they live there. Now, this is not a community without resources. This is not a community that can't be philanthropic. So part of what you have to think about is how can you work with our development office mm -hmm. to drive the people who have capacity to major gifts here for a vision that you guys can strategically put together about what you need. Right. Um, we don't expect from this community $40 million from Tisch. $40 million from Hess, or $150 million from Icon. But there are, but your needs are smaller too. Um, and your gifts can be smaller, but they should still be there. Right. So let's not forget how important philanthropy is in what are the capital improvements you see. 
when we were watching St. Vincent's <coughs> demise, its tailspin, what you would hear the doctor say is, <coughs> excuse me, oh, we have to have a new hospital. When are we going to get a new hospital? Without the new hospital, it's, things are never going to work. Well, it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. And since they never could get the money for a new hospital, right. they all thought that they were going to fail, and they failed because they couldn't get a new hospital. They didn't get a new hospital because they failed. It goes on and on and on like that. Don't get trapped yeah. in the notion that the physical plant is going to determine the happiness of your patients or your success. Um, it's still about people. Yeah. That said, there are things we can do that are modest in decorations, right. but we are things we know we have to do around some equipment that's missing that we're going to be buying, um, and the um, practice area, <coughs> which we have to improve, and we will, and expanding this campus to have more space. So we're looking right now <coughs> in the area for a place to open an urgent care center. And we'll do that, and that will decant the emergency room, which is too crowded. Um, so we want to do all those things, but I hope we wrap it up into all the issues that I raised. Yeah, you have a question? <coughs> yeah. Yes. You um, spoke of decreasing length of stay. Yeah. What are some of the changes you're making to facilitate that, and how soon will we see them put to practice? Oh, we, we have already started. Uh, I arrived here on January 24th. And one of the first challenges, of course, is that seemingly on the surface, it appeared that we didn't have capacity. And yes, and, and of course, I recognize that uh, uh, we did have capacity. And so case management now under Joanne, uh, Joanne uh, uh, Schmier uh, is now structured in a, in a different uh, way uh, that every doctor who's here gets a consolidated call from one individual. And, uh, and not from five or six different people, and thereby allowing the physician to get all their patients in one call. And those length of stays have been coming down. Uh, monthly length, length of stay in comparison to 2012, 2013, to 24 year to day, is, it's much, much lower. Uh, it, uh, it actually is very difficult to decrease length of stay, and we actually was remarkably have done so. And that's going to continue. Uh, uh, Ms. Thomas. Yeah, readmits that I think that we're, we're, uh, we're watching those. Those are one of our metrics. 30-day uh, readmission uh, have to continue to trail down uh, because if it doesn't, not only that the government doesn't pay for uh, the admission, but that they'll impose a penalty. These are the changes that are in the system. And if you don't adjust to them and you don't do them, uh, uh, you don't do it right, you don't do it successfully, uh, the hospital will not exist. Okay? Uh, there's another question. Hi. Dr. Gortzman. Hi, thank you. Um, over the last uh, two or three years, I've seen groups that should naturally be referring into this group in our catch into this hospital in our catchment area, enter into contractual relationships with other networks, and I've lost a lot of those referrals. I've noticed in my practice, and I'm sure the doctors here have as well. And I was wondering where we stand in establishing our own contractual relationships and recruiting some of these doctors. Yeah, those are, those are, uh, those are activities in progress, Dr. Gortzman. Uh, uh, we, we clearly have uh, uh, the brightest and the best strategic people with us. Those are some of the issues that are being tackled. They're a work in progress. I know exactly what you're saying. And, and, and you have to give a little bit of time for us to reverse those activities. Thank you. Hi. Is there any plans on going to the forgotten neighborhoods like Marine Park, Sheepshead Bay, Garrison Beach, where there is no met large medical groups? And the hospital the doctors do use down in Garrison Beach, I know, is Staten Island or Methodist. Yes, don't, those are, it's the same thing. For, for example, there is a, there's an effort, I'll give you an example, on the part of Dr. Isola, who's the director of cancer at Mount Sinai. And I'm going to be joining a meeting soon with Dr. Klein who's the president of the Physician Network, to address those issues. So for, if it, you know, we, for example, we'd like to establish a cancer program for Mount Sinai in Brooklyn. And so none of the areas are exempt. Uh, we'll be looking at every single area. Okay? Again, that's another work in progress. Mm -hmm. Those are one of the things we should... Uh, we will be looking at two. All right, next. Yes, hi. Okay, we're speaking about the HCAP score. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Is there ways that we could improve that? Which we, the employees, are working very hard towards that. And we're working harder than before. Even though we were working harder, we're working much harder now. Is there ways we can facilitate the family members, especially on weekends when there is no cafeteria, mm -hmm. no food for them to eat, no vending machine, and this is what creating the problem too because they have to walk out, oh, we have no food. We, right. Could I have a cup of coffee? Right. Oh, we don't have a coffee machine. Right. You know, this is part of our problem. So if there are ways, we would appreciate so it can extend our ace gap. Uh, absolutely. In fact, those are the issues that we are addressing right now. Uh, uh, from I, have, I have a comment yeah. about that. <coughs> these, are, these things that are so obvious and are missing, you should make sure that you put it in email to Lynn <coughs> or to me <coughs> or to Dennis. Yeah. <coughs> because we should fix those things. Those are obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there are things that are, more, that are subtle. And Carol Porter and Jeremy Bowl and their staff will ultimately be here and teach you the ways that we've been able to move HCAP scores in the other hospitals. Yeah, so I just want to go back to the full issue. The full issue is being addressed now, particularly Friday and Saturday. So, and, and, and those have been a, a persistent problem here. So we're in the process of, a, of addressing exactly that. Friday, Saturday, Sunday uh, related off our food issues. Thank you. Yes, hi. Um, I was at the uh, first town hall meeting when you came, and um, I know that there were a lot of questions that we all had. We were wondering um, you know, why, you, why you chose Beth Israel Brooklyn to be part of your system. And we've certainly noticed um, many changes. We're very grateful that we now have a president on site that you know, wants to make this a great place for the employees to work and, and improve you know, our, our quality standards and um, patient satisfaction and all that. But what do you see as the role of Beth Israel Brooklyn within your system? Why did you choose us and where do you see us well, playing the role in your we system? We think this is a gem. We think the hospital is great, the community is great, the staff is great, and that the sky's the limit. We want this to be the nidus of a growing network in Brooklyn. We want it to prosper. This is one of the easiest things about it. And putting Lynn in charge gave me absolute confidence that we can turn this hospital around and make it great. Any other question here? Uh, if not, I think time is up. We want to thank Dr. Davis for coming and Dr. Charney. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. <laughs>